So, hi. This is actually, this is a bit of a funny position to be in. I don't really work in F-sharp, so I'm giving a talk at F-sharp Sydney on a language that isn't F-sharp to F-sharp developers. And ironically, I'm actually going to have the least JavaScript content in my talk out of all three tonight. So it's a, it's a bit of an ironic position to be in. I'm going to be talking about Reason, which is a, a new language for a camel. But just before I get started, uh, there's a few people. I'm assuming that everyone here works in F-sharp or hobbies in F-sharp or is familiar kind of with like F-sharp. How many people are familiar with OCaml? So we've got a couple of people. Um, the way that this talk is going to run is I'll give a very, very quick introduction to what Reason is and why it exists. I'll show off the, the slight differences in syntax between Reason and F-sharp, just so you're comfortable with what the, the language itself looks like. And then we'll run into some things that you can do in Reason that I don't think you can do in F-sharp. This is all based on like research, but without practical application. If I'm wrong, and if you can do something, please tell me, because I'll take it out and feel a little bit ashamed. Um, but so we'll, we'll get started. I'm Jacob. Um, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. And today we're going to talk about Reason. So Reason, Reason is not a, a transpiler for JavaScript. It's not a JavaScript compile tool chain. It actually has very, very little to do with JavaScript. Reason, Reason is a syntax over OCaml. So OCaml is actually a really uh, pretty amazing programming language in that you can write front ends for it, you can write language syntaxes for it that are totally compatible with the bytecode and with the language, but look absolutely nothing like the default syntax for the language. So there is Lisp, uh, like visual implementations of Lisp over OCaml. There's a uh, reason coming out now. There's the, the language supports uh, something called a PPX system, which is a way of writing uh, essentially extensions uh, for the compiler that support all sorts of syntaxes. So Reason is a new syntax over the top of it, but it's, it supports all of the same paradigms that OCaml supports. So we already have OCaml, and we already have a large number of like, syntactic front ends for OCaml. Why, why would we have another one? Why would we create another one? And a little bit of the reason comes back to this uh, pretty important paper. Have, has everyone here heard of Bacchus? Has everyone, everyone who, ha if anyone hasn't heard of Bacchus, have everyone heard of like Fortran, the, the scientific language? So Bacchus was actually the, I think the architect, or at least the, the, the chief implementer of the Fortran compiler. And in 1977, I think, uh, won the Turing Award for his implementation. And the, was invited to give a paper and give a lecture as a result. And the lecture that he gave and the paper that he gave was called Can Programming Be Liberated from, uh, liberated from the Von Neumann Style of Programming? Which is the, the imperative, a procedural style of programming. And this has kind of been the question at the forefront for functional programming for a long time, is there are all of these imperative and procedural languages that exist kind of at the, the forefront of the, the industry, but there's a kind of a push happening consistently as functional programming languages come out of, can we, can we win developer mindshare? Can we... Uh, find enough uh, reasons to use these things, huh? enough reasons, uh, to use these things without kind of uh, losing people at the edges of it. And one of the big reasons for reason is the intention to push a lot of what, uh, what is thought of as the meta language of functional programming uh, away from the actual language. So what you have to learn when you come to the language isn't uh, very conceptual. All you really have to learn to come into the language is the language itself and how to implement it. And everything else is kind of pushed away. You don't have this, uh, this big hump to, to kind of jump over to get into the language. The intention is very much to be uh, able to get in and be productive as soon as possible. And so the way that they kind of approach that is by uh, looking at the syntax and identifying the syntax and then kind of workshopping the syntax with the community to try and find the, the most efficient and the least kind of friction in the syntax possible without giving up any of the actual underlying language features. So if you look at JavaScript code and JavaScript developers, JavaScript is one of the most widely used programming languages on the planet. When you try and identify how can we take people who write JavaScript for a living and introduce them to these new concepts without also having them have to learn uh, a whole new syntax uh, for, for no actual additional like value 
in, in, a, in a sense. The, the underlying concepts of functional programming are very like, separate from whatever the syntax of the language that you're using to, to program them in. So we have this JavaScript function which computes, uh, computes a sum. And here we have the same thing for reason. And the reason, the reason syntax uh, becomes a lot closer to JavaScript than it does to OCaml. And it becomes, uh, it becomes like it adds in a whole bunch of other syntactic properties like semicolons, like commas in a bunch of places. It changes a lot of things that OCaml uh, either elides or does differently. And a lot of the, the, the thought behind that is people who are coming to these languages for the first time are more familiar with C syntax or with JavaScript syntax or with PHP syntax than they are with OCaml or with Haskell or with any of the, the, the more functional programming languages. The fewer things they have to learn at a time, the better. So we're going to sprint through the syntax because the, the underlying language features, whoops, sorry, the underlying language features are very, very similar to F-sharps. So we'll start with functions. Uh, the first function defines a, a function where it takes two variables and just returns the first variable and ignores the second. Um, so you have the ability to, to define functions using the let keyword, so exactly the same as F-sharps. You can name them. You can tell them the kind of uh, arguments that they need. You can ignore the types, and the compiler will figure them out for you. Um, you can define recursive functions, again, the same as F-sharp. Um, even with the same recursive keywords, since both F-sharp and, and Reason have their roots in the ML system. Um, you can define mutually recursive functions. So you can say is even is a function that depends on a function is odd, defined as needing a function is even, and define them as mutually recursive, which is quite a nice trick. Um, we have parametric polymorphism. So we have the ability for a function to say it takes any arbitrary A and returns an arbitrary B, returns an arbitrary A, it doesn't matter, as long as the implementation details of the function don't rely on knowing the concrete type of the variable passed into the function. So here we have const. Const takes an A to a B to an A, and we have here the implementation as fun x, y, return x. We also have uh, uh, an interesting feature of the type system, which is you can kind of trick it into, into not giving you the right answer. So here we've defined wrong const as takes an A, takes a B, returns an A and fun x, y returns a y. Now, because x and y aren't concrete, the compiler says, I'd like to make that work, so we'll make b the same as a. And we'll return, because we're returning y, and you've told me that you return uh, an a, the type b must be exactly the same as type, I, uh, type a, which is not quite what we'd want. So we introduce the ability to define uh, types as different, so essentially for all. Um, and we can see here that the locally abstract const type, which defines a type a and a type b, um, when we, we can say return A and we promise you that we bind this type in this place, um, but without uh, needing to be um, explicit in this, in this function. And then we have the ability to find a for all as well. So this is all pretty similar syntax, I assume, to, to what F sharp gives you. We also have simple types. So we have abstract types. Um, you can define a type T and not need to give it an implementation. You can define a type is int and tell it that it's an int. You can define uh, abstract, uh, you can define, sorry, uh, algebraic data types. So you can define uh, a sum type and say that it's red or green or blue and use those as constructors. And those will show up again a little bit later. And you can also define product types. So you can define that a type is a tuple of int and int or of int and bool or of any two combinations of types. Um, you also have mutually recursive types. So you can define types as depending on each other's implementation. So here we have a tree which depends on a forest and a forest which depends on the cons of a list of tree. Um, and you can use those definitions to build up very rich uh, data structures. So, so far things have probably looked pretty, pretty similar, I would wager. Um, so we'll jump into things that, like I said, that I don't think you can do in F-sharp. Uh, at least I couldn't find ways to do them, or I found a lot of people saying, I can't do this thing and I wish I could. Again, if, if I know that there are, there are a lot of alternatives, but this is focusing on the, like, the actual implementation, not an alternative implementation for the feature. So the first one we'll start with is labeled arguments. So from what I saw, F sharp has labeled arguments for members, so for classes or for records, uh, for constructors like that. But Reason actually has labeled arguments just for defined functions. So you can label, uh, in this case, we've defined a function CSS that takes an argument display, and we bind display to a variable named display, and we say that it has type string. We pass it into the function, and then we build a string concatenation building a, a CSS string. And so this will give us the, the string display block when we call it CSS and the labeled, function, labeled argument of the function passing block as a display. But we can go a step further. There's a really cool thing that you can do with labeled arguments, which is you can actually give them default values. So here we've said display 
is bound in the variable display and is by default the string block. And there's a second argument, width, which is bound in the variable width with a type string. So now, if we give display flex, we get back flex, and we give width 50 and we get back 50. Or if we don't give display at all, if we completely ignore display in the function invocation, the compiler basically goes, cool, I'm gonna set that as whatever the default you gave it to me, and we'll just take whatever other arguments you have. This is really helpful in a few places, especially with like an FFI system, where you might have a lot of possible options into a function from an external, uh, an external source, and you don't wanna have to define at uh, use time every single input when you're setting some of them to none or setting some of them to not being used. Instead, you can give them defaults in the, in the uh, function definition and then just ignore them when you use them. Um, so this is used in a lot of styling libraries where you don't wanna necessarily, every potential CSS object is not the same as the ones that, like the three that you wanna use for the, the element. Um, but we can go one step further, which is every single argument for a function can be uh, labeled and defaulted and not supplied at invocation time, as long as there is at least one uh, concrete value being given. And in this case, that value is unit. So this is where we see that reason is not pure. You can give it a, a essentially a function of a unit and return something that it has no way to really compute. Um, but what you can do here is we can now have a thousand possible entries to a function and supply none of them and get back a useful value. So this is the, the, a very, very powerful feature of the labeled argument syntax for, for reason. Um, and unit in this case is supplied as the, the two parentheses with no value inside them. Uh, it's basically just like a, like a void uh, value. Um, okay, so the second thing we'll look at is the module system. So I know that F-sharp has a module system, but I've, I've also seen that it's not uh, like a first class module system. It looks like it leans quite heavily on classes and on members and on uh, those kind of abstractions. So reason and by proxy OCaml's module system is first class. And what that means is the same way that functional programming language is often defined as the ability to pass functions around to other functions, modules in reason are able to be passed as variables to other functions. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. To start with, I'm just gonna show you what the type definition for a module looks like. This should look pretty similar. So we define a module type of list. We say that it has a data type, a locally bound data type of T, which is abstract over A. And it is a, an, an algebraic data type. So it has a null constructor and a cons constructor, and that's how we just build up a list. And we have one, one member length, and length takes a list effectively and returns an int, which is the length of the list. So this should look pretty, pretty, uh, pretty similar to a lot of things that you'll have in F sharp. So now we can build a structure that implements that type. So now we build a module list and we say that for the type TA, we have a null and we have a cons constructor and we implement length of list using pattern matching and we switch on the, the patterns that we have for null and for cons and we construct the, the function that returns us the length. But um, we also have the ability to, to use these things as local uh, invocations or as global invocations. So if list is available in the namespace, we can use any method on list uh, locally, internal to the, to the module or like uh, available within the namespace. So here we define the module again and we create a, a list by calling let int list be list.cons1, cons with list.cons of two, cons with list of cons of three with the, the empty list null and we build up a list that way. But it's quite tiring to have to type list.cons, 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 list.cons. Instead, we can actually set up what's called a, a local open, where in the second example, uh, int list with, a, uh, with a, a apostrophe, we set up a list where we call list dot and then we open parentheses. Within those parentheses, the first place that it will look up for a, a function, for a member, will be within the list module. So it'll go, cons is a member of the list module, so I can just call that function directly on the list, and I can do that within this kind of local namespace. It's like setting up a block, or setting up a, a, like a local open explicitly. And the next line down with, uh, with two apostrophes is what is the, like the, the same way of doing that. So we have a local open where we open the module locally, and we can access the methods of that module locally inside that block um, directly. So something that I don't think f -sharp can do is mutually recursive modules. So if I have two modules that I want to define and their types or their methods depend on a definition inside the other module, I can define them as mutually recursive. Now, I haven't needed to do this in 
building reason code targeting reason, but when I've been building FFI systems to the web audio spec in, in a browser, there's a lot of different objects that depend on other objects that depend on the existence of the first object. So like the audio context object, for instance, has a, a, a lot of members or a lot of uh, properties that are used by other objects that also then depend on the audio context object that also then depend on any of its children. And it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of like roundabout abstractions. The ability to find these things as mutually recursive means that rather than having to hoist things out of a module where they belong into some shared abstraction, uh, that is away from where it's actually used, just so that you can use it in two places. Instead, you can define modules as mutually recursive and share their definitions at uh, definition time. So that's what we're doing here. We're defining the module foo. We're saying that it has a type equal to int, and it has a, a, a method bar um, that will give us a bar t, or it has a value bar, sorry, that will give us a, from the module bar its value, uh, its, its type. And we define t of int, and we say that bar is the, the string three. And then similarly, we define bar as taking type t string, and we say we have foo, which uses an int. So again, th this way they're both defined at define time, but they're able to use each other's definitions before they're actually uh, concretely defined. But you can actually be a little bit more clever, and reason will uh, basically elide most of that for you if what you're doing is just defining the, the type definitions. It will take care of the implementation and just say, hey, don't worry about that. The type definitions match up. These things are mutually recur uh, recursive. That's fine. So that's what the second example does, where it defines them even without the implementation. It just takes the types, which is quite a, like, quite a cool trick if you're building up very complex type structures. Um, and then I mentioned first class modules. So you can actually pass modules into a function and use them. Uh, modules are just structures. You can just basically pass them around as, as you would pass variables or as you would pass other data types. So in this case, we build a module type bumper and we build a module int bumper. And you can imagine then that maybe we have a float bumper and we have a string bumper and we have a bunch of other bumper implementations. And we have a method bump list where we take a list and we want to supply the bump uh, method for that, the, the members of that list. But we don't know when we're writing the bump list and we don't want to know when we're writing the bump list function what those types are. We don't want to think about it. We just want to be able to write some abstract uh, higher function. So instead what we have here is we have let bump list and we say for some type A, for any type A, and for a module B, where you are of the type bumper, and your inner type is the same as the type A that I've just said is local to this function, I would like you to take a list of A and apply the bumper uh, modules method to each element of that list and return a list. Um, and that's exactly what we do. We, we are able to say bump list, take module int bumper. So we supply the, we supply the module structure we've just defined, and we turn it into a first class module by calling it with module in front of it. We pass that into a function, and we call it with a, with a list one, two, three, four. And that's the same as, uh, that's basically being able to pass in an arbitrary object that has a, a number of methods on it that apply to each of the elements inside the list. So we can get towards a uh, what I'll show in, in another couple of slides, like we can get towards some of the dictionary parsing methods that simulate higher kinded types um, by being able to build up these abstractions and then pass them into functions that don't really know about the, the implementation details. Um, so we'll come, to, we'll come to that in a couple of slides. But the other thing that's really cool is because we have first class modules and because modules map one to one with the file system, we have first class files. So the two files here are list.rei and list.re. And list.rei is the same as defining a module type. It's a way of saying everything in a related implementation file has these characteristics. So we can see here we've defined type t of a as null and cons, and we've defined le uh, length as taking a t of a and returning an integer. So this now says that there'll be a list.re file that uses this type and exposes these methods and works this way. And indeed there is, there's a list.re that gives us the same implementation as the list that we saw before. Um, and when you pass, when you use that module, you're actually just referencing the, the file system. So the list.re file doesn't actually use the keyword module, it doesn't define a structure explicitly, it just defines uh, types and methods and properties. But the, the compiler and the language turns that into a module and makes it available automatically to any other module or any other file that wants to use it. So the files on the file system are actually first class, which is a pretty cool feature. Um, so we'll jump into functors, but they're not the same kind of functors like fmap functors. They're not, uh, they're not functions from A to B, F A to F B. 
Um, what they are is a way of basically mapping module behavior to other module behavior. They're a way of being abstract in the type of something that you're passing into a, a function that creates a module from that type. They're abstractions over types for modules. So what we have here is a module functor. And the module functor has a type defined locally of input of type T. And it has a type of a module type output of type, uh, type uh, sorry, that includes the type T from input. And here we have a module make. And you'll see the module make definition is a little bit different to the other modules we've seen so far. It actually looks a lot more like a function because it's a module function. It's a function that takes a module and produces a module. Um, so we have make, which is defined as taking a variable input of type input. And it returns a variable output, or it returns a type output, whose type T, whose uh, locally defined type T, is of the same type as the input T. And we just include input and pass that through. So this is, a, this is a pretty powerful structure, and the reason for that is that we can actually make fmap functors this way. We can, make, uh, we can make a whole bunch of really, really nice abstractions using these tools. So we can here, we create a module functor that is an actual fmap functor, and we say we take any type S who has a type like a boxed uh, abstraction over any A, and we define a method fmap from A to B for any TA to any TB. And we define a module type functor, which includes S and defines the, the Haskell uh, operator for fmap, uh, left angle bracket, dollar sign, right angle bracket as an infix operator. And we just basically alias, we, we highlight that we're just going to alias the fmap function supplied by the input to the, the fmap uh, infix operator supplied by the output. And then we have a function make, we have a, a module function make, a functor, that will take an S of type S and will return a functor with type T of A as the same as type S dot T of A. And all that's doing is basically saying, uh, return something at your output whose input types are the same. And so we include S, we take anything that we've defined on S, and we make it available at the top level to the, the, the module that we're actually returning. And we define the method uh, fmap, uh, we define the method left angle dollar right angle pronounced fmap as just being the same as the, the word fmap. And so now we have the ability to define as many of these uh, fmap functors as we want. So we can define the option type as including the functor.make, and we say that your type is going to be an option wrapping any arbitrary A. And we're going to define fmap for you as taking a function and taking your optional value, pattern matching on the optional value. And if the, if the value is none, then just returning none. And if the value is sum of something, applying the function f to the value inside the option and returning sum wrapping that value. And now we've defined fmap. So now when we want to uh, apply a function to the inside of an option value, we can apply it. Similarly for the list functor, we do the same for the list. We define fmap as operating a fold over the list and consing the values. And so we now take any function f that operates from a to b. We take a list of a's and we return a list of b's. So this is pretty cool. But we can see that the, the fmap is not ad hoc. It's not ad hoc polymorphic. Um, so it's actually the opposite of ad hoc. It's very specifically polymorphic. There isn't a way to, to uh, send uh, like fmap, just a bare function invocation to the right functor or to the right module um, at compile time, we have to be explicit and say we're using a list and we want to use the list's fmap uh, function, use it in this place. Um, it's not like Haskell or Agda or Idris or any of the, the higher kinded type uh, functional programming languages. It just gives you the ability to find these really nice abstractions over modules. Um, so in this case, what we have here is a, a, another functor demo that takes something that is of type functor and runs these two, builds these two, uh, these two functions on it. So uh, example one and example two. And so we build a list demo by supplying the functor list to the functor demo, sorry, the module list to the, the functor demo, and we build out something that can uh, run those two examples. And then if we ran, uh, if we ran list demo.eg1 and we gave it a value, it would run the, the list's fmap over the, uh, the value supplied. So, Another thing that we'll cover is uh, GADTs. Has everyone heard of generalized algebraic data types? A couple of people? OK, so everyone's heard of just algebraic data types, right? F, F sharp has them. They're first class citizens of the language. A GADT is a little bit more complex. But we'll start by building up a, a, an ordinary ADT. So we can define a type term as being an int. I told, I told you that there would be this. Uh, we can define a type term as being an int or a bool. We can't, right? Because they're not able to be, uh, they're not able to be, what's the word I'm looking for? Eh, it's fine. They're not able to be used together. 
um, as, a, as a concrete type. We could define a type term as being some algebraic data type int wrapping a, a type int and some algebraic data type bool wrapping a type bool and then use those constructors to tell the difference between them at any given time. But then when we try and define our eval function and we say for any type a take a term a and return an a and so we, take a, we have a function that takes a term and does some pattern matching based on that term we're not able to return, we take int x and return x, and we take bool b and return b, but we're back at the same problem of having to try and return something that can't be used at the same time, they can't be used together. Um, so it's not possible to define a function that returns two different types. You have to lift that up into an algebraic data type and then return it wrapped in one of the constructors of the algebraic data type, that's how the, the inner type system works. And it's the same in f sharp, I believe unless you like reach way out into any of the FFI into something outside of the language itself, I think, but it is perfect. Um, so here we build up a, a bit of a richer ADT. So we've got a little bit of a, like a, a small language being embedded, a DSL being embedded in the language. And we have a type term which gives us zero or gives us the successor or gives us a bool or gives us is zero or gives us if. And these are some very, very small grammars to give us uh, a very, very simple uh, mathematic language inside the, the syntax. But when we try and define eval, what, should, what happens? Can anyone, can anyone guess looking at that what, what will happen when we try and compile eval? So we'll get basically when we try and compile eval, the first case that we handle in the switch returns zero. But zero is not of type A, it's of type int. And the second case returns eval x plus one, which is an int, but that's not the same as of type A. And bool b returns a bool, but that's not of type A, and so on. We're not able to actually unify any of these types into something that the compiler is able to deal with. So this fails with a, with a type error. So it's not able to actually give us anything that we can use. We can't compile anything with this. But instead, we can use, um, we can use something called a GADT. And what a GADT is, is effectively a way of saying for the, the type that you're defining, for the ADT that you're defining, the return types of that are still members of the ADT that you're defining. So I'm defining a type term of a polymorphic A here. But I'm telling you that term int is a valid return type of term polymorphic A, which is exactly still within the family that term bool is and still within the family that term bool is, and still within the family that term polymorphic A is. These are all able to be unified and used as return values of a function that uses this algebraic data type. So this is really powerful, this is really useful, because now we can define our eval function. And because we say that the function can return term int, that, that, using it, that a, a term int is a valid output of this ADT, when we extract the type, zero is now a valid member of the, of the function that we're trying to return. But you'll notice that it's actually zero is being returned next to a Boolean. So we have this, this really cool feature of actually being able to return multiple return types from a, from a function using this, uh, this syntax. It's really, really helpful for de uh, defining parsers and defining grammars and defining di uh, domain-specific languages. It's a very, very nice feature, um, very powerful. Um, and so now when we eval zero, we get zero. When we eval the successor to zero, we get one. When we eval the successor to the successor to zero, we get two. If we eval bool false, we get false. If we eval is zero, zero, we get true. And the same if we eval one, we don't get true. And we now have the ability to build up this really nice uh, language inside our language. So if we were working on some very specific domain problem, we're able to build up a very nice elaborate domain specific language to solve that, that comes with all of the type guarantees that the language you're using to build it has um, at compile time guaranteed. So the last thing that I'll touch on are the compile targets and some interop uh, that is really nice. So the native compilation for OCaml is really nice. I know that F-sharp has AOT compilation um, from a, a variety of different places, but this is a first class native compilation for a variety of targets, which is quite nice. And the day-to-day -day usage of it also assumes a native compilation. Um, so if you're targeting a server where, oh, this isn't as much a problem now with .NET Core, but if you're targeting a server where .NET isn't available or where you're not going through the process of running it or for whatever reason, something like OCaml which compiles down to a native binary and just has a single deploy target is quite nice. Um, the other thing that's really nice, and we've just seen from, from Fable, um, this is the only bit of JavaScript, this uh, and the next slide are the only bits of JavaScript in the talk. So we have something called Buckle Scripts. We also have something called JS of OCaml, but I'm gonna show off Buckle Script because it's quite a cool project. 
um, it produces totally readable JavaScript as an output of input of OCaml, which is quite amazing. But the other really cool thing is it's blazingly fast, and it has the ability to tell you whether or not the functions that you're defining are pure, which is a really, really cool feature. Um, this, the defining the FFI with buckle script, which is a totally different talk, totally different day, but defining an FFI through buckle script is a total joy. It's an amazing piece of technology. I've written, I've written a bunch of like, projects to kind of test how, it can, how well it can do, and it is so much fun to FFI out through this thing. You get a lot of type safety. It makes it very easy. It has a whole bunch of uh, compile time macros that hold your hand through a lot of the process, and it's just a very, very pleasant way to, to write that kind of, uh, that kind of FFI. Um, similarly, because Reason is being developed by Facebook, one of the biggest things that they're going to be interested in is the ability to write React with Reason. Um, and in this case, Reason, uh, React has first-class bindings for Reason, being maintained by uh, the person who actually invented React in the first place. Um, so Jordan Walk, who created, was one of the creators of React, is also one of the people pioneering Reason. And uh, there's a lot of really good work um, by the community and by uh, Facebook to build really, really good React bindings for it. So we can see here we build a module, and we have a bunch of uh, includes. We have some functors. We have uh, some really cool stuff. The other nice thing we have is JSX as a first-class citizen of the language. So because OCaml makes it so easy for you to find alternative syntaxes for the language, you can actually write JSX in line inside your OCaml. Um, and it just picks up that it's JSX and kind of deals with that. It's a really, really powerful and really clever uh, kind of way to write web uh, templating code. It's quite nice. Um, so OCaml is a really cool language. Reason is a really nice syntax. And combined, it makes for a really, really enjoyable developer experience.